Please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténganse alejado de las puertas. While you're in sunny Florida, be sure to visit... Orlando! Enter into a world of epic adventure. Hello, everyone out there. This is Adam. You're listening to Warlando, and tonight I have with me Joshua. Uh, you prefer Joshua or Josh? Oh, uh, Joshua. Joshua. Okay. Hey, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we actually have two uh, tournament organizers, and we're both named Joshua, so one goes by Josh, and I go by Joshua. That that settles it. That makes it a little easier. <laughs> yeah, very. So you're the main organizer for Coliseum of Comics in Kissimmee. Uh, yeah, there's three of us. Uh, Tim Wright does mostly all the 40K stuff, 40K kill team, um, all that genre of things. He also runs the narrative 40K event at Crucible. And I do um, all of the Age of Sigmar, Warhammer, Shadespire, well, Warhammer Underworlds. Um, stuff at Coliseum. I don't run anything at uh, Crucible. That is run by um, <clears throat> John. He's uh, a Games Workshop employee that works up at Winter Park. So mm-hmm. I just play there. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. And you've done pretty well there in the past. Oh, yeah. I uh, The first year I took best order and best overall. And then the year after that, um, my, I guess you could call him my rival, um, William, he, uh, he took best and I took second and I took best in order, which is kind of funny because we were both playing an order army. So how that worked out, not quite sure. I think that same thing happened this past year as well, uh, with, uh, I believe it was Chris got the death award best in death, but it was William that won best overall with the death army. I think mm-hmm. he just like, he, he, John's nice. He likes to spread out the prizes. If you're, you get something if you're all the way at the top like that. Oh but, yeah, but not definitely. Like, yeah. yeah I, I had the pleasure of playing uh, against William a couple of times. And he, it, it is a pleasure while he's stomping on your face. He's a, he's a really right. nice guy. Uh, but well, he, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was, I was going to say, um, William, I've witnessed William stomping faces plenty of times, but uh, his games and my games is like watching um, General Lee and uh, Grant go at it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, two master tacticians against each other. So he just has uh, more major events under his belt because he won Nova, he won LVO. He came close. He got second at LVO, I think. Somewhere in there. Or not LVO, ATC. He got second at ATC. Where's but then ATC? Rob. It's in Tennessee, I believe. It's the American Team Championship. I believe oh, this okay. year is the first year they did Age of Sigmar. Normally, it's a big 40K event. Mm-hmm. But because of how fast Age of Sigmar has been growing, events have been popping up left and right, especially these big cross-country events. And um, But it's funny because Rob Bear from Spiky Bits mm-hmm. won ATC. But he used an illegal list. What? So. <laughs> I didn't hear about this. <laughs> well, <clears throat> apparently, it was an honest mistake because Forge World had changed the points on the troll hag, I believe, and which made his list invalid. Uh, and he was using the old points. So, it was right around the... Uh, it was in July, so it was right after the second edition dropped so honest yeah. mistake but rob bear came out and said hey my bad um you know i'll forfeit they didn't actually have to um there wasn't any drama surrounding it and uh he was actually the one who brought it up great guy you know said hey awesome. i messed up you know will deserves this and uh, i'm gonna take a year break as punishment wow. so he he self-inflicted punishment upon himself just to be you know, a great uh, example of what we should be upholding in the community. And um, ATC didn't really have to do anything. He uh, did it all himself. But he's also a 
I would say a Warhammer celebrity there too. So yeah, <clears throat> so that's uh, you know something interesting. And that, then that of course William won best like general at Nova points wise, but then ended up losing it because of hobby score, which was has been talked about on many podcasts about whether, you know, hobby score should have such a detriment detrimental effect on your overall if you end up, you know, smashing everyone. But um Yeah, uh, they say what aspect of his hobby score? Um so it was he didn't score enough the Nova rubric was a very brutal rubric when it came to your hobby and you had to read and basically model and paint to this rubric in order to score max points and unfortunately William didn't do that I guess his army looks beautiful his Nagash is a is a um, custom Nagash where he took the horses from uh, the I can't think the mortis engine mm -hmm. and um so it looks like horses are coming out of ghost horses are coming out of nagash's cloak which is really cool but um just you had to have so many models converted and he didn't and he had airbrushed his bases instead of using a some sort of paint or product on them like sand or whatnot so he got marked down for that but it wasn't that his army looked bad it just didn't check the boxes that nova required to get those points wow yeah that, but that's it's, frustrating mm -hmm. so he, he's traveling a long way nova that's in uh is that in virginia yeah, it's uh, actually it's in Washington D.C. At, right at that border right there. Gotcha. It's actually at the hotel that's connected to the uh, airport, I believe. Okay. So, have you been to it? I, I have never been to it. Um, I'm planning on going this year. I wanted to go last year, but work did not allow that to happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I know the feeling. Mm -hmm. that, that's too bad but hopefully you'll you'll get a chance to get out to some of these i mean particularly if you're, oh, you and william are neck and neck and he's bringing these mm -hmm. uh prizes home It'd be nice to see you get out there oh i'd love to and uh the only thing like william's a very flavor of the month he has he can put out an army very quickly and mm -hmm. um he's talented with the airbrush and uh so he he plays what is the best army at the time of the month um i play what, I play competitively, but I have a Sylvaneth army, and that's pretty much what I work on mostly. I started building a Zinch army to try to stay competitive, but then Zinch got knocked down 15 or 17 pegs here. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to stick with what I like and work on expanding my Sylvaneth till it's done. I Yeah, I completely understand. I. I would spend all the money I had on Warhammer if I didn't have anything reining me in, like, you know, those basic survival needs. Uh, right. Otherwise, yeah, I would have each one of those armies. But, yeah, having the the money to buy the latest, greatest, and then the, the free time and the talent to make it worthy of looking at on the table in time mm -hmm. for it to still be current, I don't, have, I don't have that. I have to, you know, focus on the things I enjoy. You know, oh, like definitely. Saying, I, I feel very lucky right now that I've, Right when the latest version of the the Witch Elf model came out, <laughs> I was already a uh, back in fantasy. I was already a, a Dark Elf player. Mm -hmm. So when this Daughters of Cain book came out, I already had most of the models. I already had the Cauldron and tons of Witch Elves, and so it was really a, a piece of cake to just roll into the new stuff. I didn't have to make anything really new. So it's nice right. to have a, a competitive army right now. Like you're saying, just focusing on the thing that i like yeah it's definitely yeah in fantasy eighth edition and previously like your competitive army could last five six years mm -hmm. but in today's environment with how involved gw is now with the community um your competitive army lasts between general's handbooks so yeah you know if you're trying to stay at that top tier competitive with what is the most overpowered list or whatnot and hoping that the mid 
your FAQs don't break it, you know, you're you're almost guaranteed to be buying a whole brand new army every year, which a lot of us cannot afford and do not have the time to do that. So when new people are trying to get in the hobby, I cannot emphasize more build what you think looks cool and what you will enjoy pushing around on the table because even if it's not the best right now you'll never know a year from now it could go from the worst model to the best model um my best example would be alarial alarial hasn't been playable since in a competitive scene um since she was released but with her new um FAQ or not FAQ with the new summoning rules and all that you now see her in competitive lists and I think she's an awesome model mm -hmm. so it's just that's the best advice when I I can give to a brand new player is just always get what you think looks cool because at some point it will be really well yeah or it will do really well and it seems like there's so much more customization since we got second edition the different mm -hmm. spells you can take, the vanless spells, and then the realm rules, the artifacts uh, that you can take from the different realms when you're building your list. There's a lot of little ways you can customize to still get, maybe kick up the areas where you were weak in those units you're talking about. Oh, definitely. About. Well, it's like when they introduce the uh, um, realm artifacts, that made a lot of of the older armies that don't have battle tomes yet more viable like um brian who has placed high over at um warhammer world a few times who plays a mixed order army mm -hmm. um using the model out of warhammer quest the uh dark elf assassin or yeah. he might not be a dark elf and giving him the sort of judgment you know he went from a mediocre no one would ever really play him competitively to now this god mode assassin in a mixed <laughs> order list where you're just like this guy will nuke whatever he touches so and, uh, what artifact was it the sword of judgment i believe it's out of the realm of light mm -hmm. it's whenever you hit a six it does mortal wounds and he has so many attacks but also when he charges, he gets plus to hits. So now it's not only doing it on sixes, it's doing it on fives. Um, I haven't played the model myself. I was just mm -hmm. listening to him. He got interviewed on a podcast that I listened to. Oh, which and, one? Uh, um, I think it was the new one with Rob, the XGW employee. I can't think what his podcast is called. He just created a brand new website. Um, there's so many coming up. If you think about oh, it, oh, there's so. Yeah, if you think about it, let me know and I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think some of the main ones that I listen to are Warhammer Weekly with um, Tom Lyons and Vince Ventrilo, and. Uh, that's that's another podcast I'd love to interview on, but they're they're up at the top there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. So, mm -hmm. uh, there's another one I was listening to recently called Just Saying. Mm -hmm. You heard that one? I, I've been enjoying listening to that one. They sound like a pretty. I think they're out of New Zealand, but I'm just going to sound oh, okay. like an ignorant American in saying so. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's there was a, a Scottish. Scottish one. There's just so many of them. It's hard to keep all of them straight. Yeah. But there's so many great guys putting out so much great content now for Age of Sigmar, and um, it, it's it's light years from what we had when this first came out, and GW kind of shot themselves in the foot. Right. Yeah. That was that was a dark time. Oh, it was. It was <laughs> people burning armies, and oh, oh man. <laughs> You're talking about that Dark Elf video, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just like, I had just bought cried it. a little on the inside. <laughs> oh, me too. I couldn't believe it. I just wanted to, like, scream. Like, I, I couldn't, I was just in such shock seeing someone. Uh -huh. I mean, even if, like, I, you say, I'm never going to play this again. Give it to someone to sell it, and they give that money to some charity or something. You know, because that was at least two hundred dollars worth of models that he just. Oh, that's a 
that was way more than 200. I was like, as the camera was panning over it, I'm just mentally like, that unit's like $300. Yeah. That, that's like, mm-hmm. what, what is, oh, as I, someone actually added it up. It was, it was, a, it was a couple thousand dollars worth of models. <laughs> oh it was God. ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, if, if, I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> you're going to spend that, that, that kind of money. I mean, at least everybody knows it happened. You know, oh, like, yeah. people know about that video. People have watched it. I've been talking about it since I saw it like two years ago, three years ago now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he got, he got plenty of uh, revenue from uh, YouTube if he got enough uh, hits on that video <laughs> just to so. pay for burning it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I hope he got something back from it. Mm-hmm. How did you get into this? How did you get into wargaming? So I was 12 years old. Um, back in the 90s, and I was really big into medieval, um, Romanesque, fantasy type thing. And um, I used to play a game called Caesar 3, where you'd build cities and stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, one day we went to, this is back in Michigan, went to the Great Lakes Crossing Mall uh, with my grandma and my aunt and saw a games workshop store and we're like, oh, what's this? And I walk in and of course they do the whole, hey, have you seen this? And they give you a demo game. And um, so I did my demo game and they showed me the starter set, which at the time was for sixth edition, fifth edition, just got over. And um, it was the Orcs and um, Empire starter set. And um, I was like, oh, this is really cool. And I saw the High Elves, and I was like, the this High Elf Spearman looked a lot like the Roman you know, tower shield and spears and that massed infantry. I was like, oh, that's really cool. I want to do those. And they're like, well, we're redoing those, so we're sold out of them. Oh. Like, ugh. And they're like, how about dwarves? And I was like, <laughs> all right. Well, they didn't do the big battle forces back then. This is right before they started doing those. And um, so they had, like, the created battle forces. And my grandma, for Christmas, <laughs> bought her 12-year-old grandson the big mega force they had for Christmas and it was like three boxes of dwarf warriors and a bunch of thunders and some war machines and stuff and um, that's cool that was the start of probably what I have like 15,000 points of dwarfs now (laughs) but um or now called dispossessed yeah but yep nope that's how I got into it and it was just all downhill from there and I've kind of kept up with it steady I really haven't had any years where I just quit you know stuff slowed down here and there you know going through school and I had friends at school who played with me and some of my cousins and we had the good old years of playing in my dad's basement and uh, we had a pool table down there that we put a four by eight sheet of plywood on and got um when GW used to sell the big sheet of green, it wasn't quite static grass, but whatever, it's and put that on felt. there. Yeah, it was kind of, and um, yeah, played lots and lots of games with my brother and a couple of our friends down in the basement almost every weekend. And it's funny, and we'd argue about rules, and we'd call up the <laughs> games workshop and be like, "This is what's going on," and uh, Mike you, you Bell actually call them. Oh, we would call them. We'd have rules disputes and be like, hey, how, what? Because we didn't have the internet at the time to look this stuff up. Oh, yeah. Because it was, you know, AOL dial-up. And that would have took, you know, an hour to find something if it was available online. And, um, yep, Michael Bell, who is the manager at the Great Lakes Crossing, um he would always answer and he was a great help like i cannot tell you now being in customer service myself how annoying we must have been (laughs) but they loved hearing these stories because i got older and i would start going down to that store and uh he's like yep you're the kids that would always call on the weekends and and it was uh kind of funny just like reminiscing and but yeah that's I could That's see him how I being. Got started. I could see him being annoyed, but you're also his bread and butter. 
Oh, I'm, totally. Yeah. I'm sure I'm I mean, sure you were more fun than annoying. Oh yeah. Not 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 as great now. I mean, now that I'm a, an adult without children. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have more bread to or butter to spend on my bread now. <laughs> but uh <laughs> and yep. And it was I think I got into competitive wargaming. I moved um out to Arizona. Um, to go to college at Arizona State University, and there was a uh, store out there, and I started playing competitive 40K, and this is during 5th edition 40K, when Grey Knights were just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Is and that what so you were playing? I, yeah, I had, a, uh, I had a 20 Paladin Drago Librarian Army, and um, it was it was fantastic. It might have been sixth edition. It all kind of merges together at the end of the day, you know. Yeah. And um, and I came down to Florida on a Disney college program internship, and uh, they had a really great fantasy scene down here in Kissimmee, mm-hmm. and they had monthly fantasy tournaments at the Com- um, Coliseum of Comics. And uh, I would go in, smash face every single weekend, <laughs> and um, I won most of the local tournaments they had. I lost a few here and there, and um, then I found out about Crucible, and I was like, oh, okay, so this is a big event. And when I first attended Crucible, which was Crucible 3, mm-hmm. um, we had 60 players at Crucible for Fantasy, which was awesome. And um, the first year I was there, Tom Keegan, he's one of the one of the organizers at the time. He's no longer with them because he just wants to play as well. Mm-hmm. And um, he ended up winning with the Dark Elf, Witch Elf, Cauldron, Death Star, and yeah. I was using the Illyrial, um White Lion Death Star. Him and I never played each other, but um, it was it was quite an experience for a first major event. And after that, I just started traveling around Florida and going to every tournament I could get my hands on. And um, then the guy who ran the tournaments at Coliseum bought a house up in northern Florida. Mm-hmm. And he was the games manager. Great guy. He would, uh, he'd be like, you know, this all this stuff is coming out. You want any of this? I was like, yeah. And he was able to get me limited edition stuff that would sell out immediately. And I'm like, this is awesome. Uh, his name was Steve. Mm-hmm. And um, he moved and he said, well, how about you start running stuff? <laughs> <laughs> That's the torch. And uh, I said, yep, I would love to do that. So I went from smashing all the tournaments to running all of the tournaments. How's and that transition been? It's, uh, I miss playing sometimes, mm-hmm. but running the leagues and running the tournaments has been quite a interesting learning experience and a way for me to grow in my hobby. And it's... When Age of Sigmar first began, there wasn't a lot of structure to it, so we didn't we didn't really have tournaments. We had more leagues and Mm -hmm. open play type stuff, Um, which I've kept the leagues and narrative aspect. So it's not necessarily whether you win or lose; it's about the story and you know creating those awesome moments that. Yeah, you know, my my Bretonian paladin killed your um, Frostheart Phoenix with the anointed on top of it because I rolled a six with my heroic killing blow. That's from fantasy, but yeah. you know, it's moments like that that you'll remember forever, and absolutely, uh, that's what I get excited about as part of the narrative aspect. And then being a organizer for narrative leagues and stuff, you're like playing the dungeon master in a game of D and D. So you get to have the fun of killing people's armies without being the one that's pushing their stuff around or creating those insane events. When they did the Malign Portents 
event last year that was so much fun because one of the the other tournament organizer who runs Malifo, his name's Josh, um, he has just ten thousand points of undead, and we were running. It was basically kind of a hybrid path to glory, and he was doing so well. His undead army was so huge by the end of it. We did a mega battle stretching across three um, six by four tables. And it was basically everyone else versus his army. And which is exactly how the story went. It was all of the, you know, order, destruction, chaos armies versus Nagash. And cool. um, cool. I gave I Yeah, and I gave him Nagash to use so that it, you know, balanced things out. And it was just really awesome having all of the tools that GW has given us in these campaigns to just create such awesome events and because what I would do is I'd time it you know you have 15 minutes everyone to compete to complete their hero phase and at the end of that 15 minutes something happened mm -hmm. and then you have 10 minutes to complete your movement phase and then at the end of that 10 minutes something happened and um, something cool that I did was as units would die, they would come back to life. But the more times they would die, the more undead they would become. So Nagash could take control of them, which was really cool. That's fun. But, um, and then as far as the tournaments go, it's learning your players you know what are they looking for um do they want straight up out of the book um scenarios and that's it or do they want more of the story driven tournament and that's been a learning curve that i've had from the start to the beginning like i started out you know real intense story and i had these awesome scenarios that i thought were great and they looked great on paper mm. but they involved a lot of bookkeeping and that's one of the biggest things that i've taken from running tournaments over the past couple of years is that the less bookkeeping that you can do and more things that you can calculate once the game is finished because most of the scenarios you're already keeping track of how many points you have from holding objectives or whatnot so having like i feel that having secondary objectives is not only key to helping divide up the players this is also a controversial topic that i've heard a lot of podcasts discuss as well but these are my personal feelings on them and just doing simple things like did you kill your opponent's general is your general alive do you com control more of the table quarters did you kill more of your opponent's army than he did of yours you know stuff like that and but still having the scenario that's out of the book, don't make any changes to that, and having that, mm. you know, worth the most points, whether you win, lose, or draw on that. And um, just having those extra few secondary points to really get a divide between so that you can get the best players at the top and the players who did not have the best dice rolls, you know, playing each other so that hopefully everyone has a decent time because at the end of the day you know we're playing a game and we all want to have a good time and and bring home the story you're talking about exactly and if you've got one player who's you know smashing your army in turn two and you're playing the hey just remove all my models off the table game that's no fun for you mm -hmm. so you may not win the tournament, but I still want you to have decent games. And I think that's what I try to really impress, is to enjoy the games. And to incentivize that, yes, my best general gets the top prize, and then I have a best painted. So it doesn't matter how good you did. If your army looks beautiful, you're going to get a real good prize, too. Yeah. And then on top of that, I do raffles. You know, if you participate, you get a raffle ticket, and 
you could have came in last and still walked away with, you know, a real nice prize. So that's something I like to do with my tournaments with prize support is so that everyone has a chance of getting something, whether they win or not. And, uh, of course, there's the brick award at the end of the day is <laughs> whoever gets last place gets new dice. And um, that's, that's very nice. I like that a lot. Oh, I love that. Well, it's in the transition between fantasy and General's Handbook, Age of Sigmar, mm -hmm. um, I played a lot of Kings of War because I still wanted to use my fantasy armies. Yeah, I was right there with you. Yep, and a lot of us, I went to a lot of Kings of War tournaments, and I just... Kings of War kind of scratched that fantasy itch, but not the way Warhammer Fantasy did. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't compare Age of Sigmar to Warhammer Fantasy. It's the same fantasy aesthetic, even though Age of Sigmar is a real high fantasy with steampunk. And, you know, there's a lot more that Games Workshop can do with Age of Sigmar. And I get that, and that's really cool. And I am so psyched that they are moving the story forward. Yes, yes consistently like every year it's going forward there's new stuff like we're not stuck at the realm gate where sigmar dropped in the sigmarines <laughs> I, I, yeah. the sigmarites and uh or stormcast there we go gotta get all my wording here and not make fun of them <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking about the same thing in our last episode that we felt like because we yeah we I mean, you can listen to it but we we didn't feel like there was anything happening like we, we felt like it was just like, here's the Stormcast, it's a new world, and yep. I, I, there was, yeah, the, there wasn't that much then. Now nope. there is so much information, so much to play with. It's great. It's really exciting time to be a part of it. Oh, it is amazing. Well, I really feel that when they got the new CEO and really changed the direction of the Games Workshop company is when things became really good. You know, when Games Workshop got back into social media, when they started doing the YouTube channel, when they started live streaming events, like, this is the best Games Workshop has been since I first got into it. That, I mean, I've only been in it for five years, but in the five years, it's absolutely the best it's ever been, and it looks like it's just oh, yeah. nothing but good things on the horizon. I can't wait for the Tyrion and Teclas rumored angel elves or whatever. I just want to use my high elves again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I'm really hoping for, because I had all the dark elves, I'm really hoping for shadow elves that are out there. Oh, with, yeah. Uh, Malyrian and whatever that's going to be. Oh, I can't wait to see what they come up with. You know, how they did the transforming Marathi model yeah. with Malarian, well... <laughs> Malkith merged with this dragon Saffron, you know, and now he's Malarian. Yeah. And uh, I can't wait for the model they come up with that because the Marathi model is just like, oh my gosh, I love that model it, so much. I, I just, uh, I've been playing with it and it was so much fun to put together and paint. The detail is just impeccable. It's, it's a, it is an actual joy to paint. Mm-hmm. Well, Games Workshop is just light years ahead of every other company in their plastic molds. Yeah. Like, there's just no one else that can compete. There's some stuff that uses resin and stuff, like Creature Caster. They have some amazing demon prints, or greater demon stuff that, you know... But, like, the new stuff GW's been coming out with, the new Bloodthirster, the new um, greater unclean one, I cannot wait for the new keeper of secrets yeah like i am so excited for that and hopefully they don't do the stupid dumb cow whatever face they had on the old one but oh yeah i hope not i don't the, the yeah. tongue thing yeah yeah no 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 um like the forge world greater keeper of secrets i hope it's closer to that but not put together you know 800 individual hairs that can break <laughs> that are resin <laughs> i was talking to a guy who built that he's like this model is a nightmare to put together yeah but um no totally i'm sure we'll see that in january february but looking forward to that and the the new 
the new models for the goblins are just yeah. oh, wow whoa like i don't <laughs> play goblins i've never mm-hmm. played goblins but now i want to play goblins <laughs> they, it's so yeah I'm, I'm i don't have any I'm, right now my itch is to have something in each one of the four groups you know mm-hmm. I, I've, I've got um dark elves i i'm starting to put together the night haunt um but I yeah I don't have anything uh, in chaos or destruction. Man yeah those those grots are very tempting. Very oh tempting yeah definitely. Their their tactics now their marketing and their release strategy it's mm-hmm. it's just fantastic. They do such a good job of selling those models and really showing off what they've done. Oh def I mean don't get me wrong they've had some blunders, but how they did this grot release is like perfect. Like yeah. keep that up do that every time and you know that's that's awesome and i uh hope to see something soon for slanesh because we got the wrath and rapture thing yeah it's gotta be you you know it's just hanging out there oh yeah totally you know they've had i'm sure duncan and peachy have painted all of that stuff because every time they've done interviews with these games workshop employees they're like this is going to be our best year yet you wow. know they were interviewing a uh, uh heavy metal painter he's like these models that i've been painting that i cannot tell you guys about are the most amazing models i have painted to date and i'm just like oh come on elves <laughs> <laughs> i know i know we waited so patiently i mean the sylvan F- you know, we had that pretty early, but they're not really elves. I mean, they're kind of, they're, they're woodland spirits, but yeah, finally, right. new elf models. Mm-hmm. How do you feel well, about like, the Deepkin? Um, <laughs> I haven't seen Aquaman yet, <laughs> <laughs> but what I've been told by my friends is if you go see Aquaman, you're going to want to play Deepkin. <laughs> really? That's cool. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, when they first came out, I was like, what do you mean water in the sky? They're flying. What? Yeah. And I'm like, it was kind of, I'm still applying my fantasy mind to the age of Sigmar world. And you really have to get over that. Yeah. Like this is, these are magic flatters, bubbles (laughs) that, that don't follow our laws of physics nope and it's a magical sea and you gotta think like that and uh, once you get over that hurdle i think the aesthetic of the um deep kin is really cool i wish there were other viable builds than what's going on right now with the Mm -hmm. deep striking you know twenty thousand eels and murdering your face turn three yeah and because a lot all the models are super cool that turtle is amazing yeah and it's just like i would love to see more varied builds and things instead of spammy builds which you know i feel like fantasy had a built-in rule for that where you could only take x amount of special x amount of rare Mm -hmm. but not to really avoid that spammy building but then you know it's still then you got horde units and or the death stars yeah Yeah. but where units are now limited to the max amount of models you can take that can also cap off those horde units and the death stars Mm -hmm. especially that you can't attach characters to units yeah and but overall the deep can i really like them i uh i actually got a um <laughs> i was on ebay one day and there's some guy he's like had a whole deep can army listed and it was like seven hundred dollars and he's like 40 percent off everything and i'm like okay (laughs) and then and then paypal is like we're running a special right now would you like 24 um 24 months no interest bye (laughs) (laughs) did you end up getting it oh yeah totally awesome they 
are sitting in my closet right now in my closet of shame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, yeah. But I will get around to them as soon as the Sylvaneth army is finished. Because I'm actually, I'm registered for Adepticon this year at the end of March. Oh, that's great. Yep. And uh, that's the first time I've ever gone to Adepticon. I'm actually um, going with a few buddies from down here. And I'm registered for the Age of Sigmar um, tournament, the GT. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing the the Thunderdome one. Yeah? Yeah. I don't know anything about it. It's a big narrative event. And it's on third because Adepticon. Are you familiar with Adepticon? Oh yeah, from the podcast and from watching stuff on YouTube, but never been. Right. So Adepticon is the largest wargaming event in the country. You know, if you're going to go to one event, Adepticon is the thing to go to. And this is represented by the fact that tickets were sold out for most events half hour after they went live. Wow. And um, there's 200 spots for Age of Sigmar, I believe. And I'm That's like, huge. I've never seen, I've never been or seen an event that huge. Like, the biggest thing I've been to is the Chicago Game Stay back in the day. And that was big, you know, and that was run by Games Workshop. But, yeah, I'm real excited about that. Um, I totally lost track of what no. we were talking about. <laughs> you were there. talking about uh, taking your Deepkin up to Adepticon. Oh, yeah. Um, Sylvaneth, taking the Sylvaneth. Oh, up you're, to... you're not going to take the deep can up there? No, no, I'm working on my Sylvaneth right oh, now. Because okay. the, uh, the Sylvaneth are, are halfway done because I had them for Crucible, so I'm just putting more into the army, and I want to finish that army before I start another army. And um, once I finish that army, deep can are definitely on the uh, on the work table for getting built and made, and I'm kind of curious what's going to happen to them in the uh, coming General's Handbook. I'm sure uh, your poor witch elves are going to get hit. They're they're going to. Some of the stuff they (laughs) can do is just ridiculous. I was Uh, uh, playing a game where uh, my friend Mark, uh, he Mark had his bloodthirster in a position where I managed to get my forty witch or thirty witch elves just completely all the way around him. Oh, Uh, he's dead. (laughs) Oh, oh, yeah. I, I think I ended up doing something like 120 attacks. Oh yeah, and yeah, had that's every buff in place, so sixes mm-hmm. caused two attacks, and you know it, it. It was it was ridiculous what they can do if they're they're buffed in the one spot. So yeah, that's just the way it goes. Um, Nicholas had his uh, carriage and overlords, and he they got nerfed really hard, really quickly oh. right when that handbook came out last year. Uh, Which you know I don't get because carriage and overlords weren't. Like, Zinch needed it. They didn't need it as hard as they got it. But Caradron weren't, you know, dominating the competitive scene. And I've seen a lot of people talk about, you know, Tom Lyons is one of them. He was heavy into the uh, um, Caradron overlords. And they're just, what you see in the battle tome is not what they are now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just still great. And I still I love yeah. the models. Oh, the aesthetic the of them are amazing. Yeah, like I, I have some of those also in my closet of shame. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know because when those Christmas bundles come out, it's just ho- so hard to pass those up. I know what you mean. Yeah, and uh, but yeah, I, w- I was gonna play them, and then they got the rules changed, and I'm like, man, in order to have a unit of ten. Um, Arcanaut Company with three light sky hooks. You got to buy three boxes of Arcanaut Company. Yeah, and it's like ah, I'm not going to do that, you know. And I'm the kind of player that wants to play what you see is what you get. So I'm yeah. not going to put the other weapons and be like, oh no, no, they're not. Uh, they're all light sky hooks. I feel that that creates a bad. Um, vibe between players you know i think that have... i haven't heard anything official mike i kind of suspect gw for punishing parts of the community for pursuing that because I, I think they want it to be what you see is what you get but wasn't oh, that 100 percent? yeah yeah there was yeah where they like people were buying like 10 of those boxes just mm-hmm. to have that 10 light sky hook unit mm-hmm. right well 
what they so what originally happened was the Thunderers had the drill cannons, I believe, mm -hmm. and you had to buy a ton of boxes to get the one or two drill cannons to make your Thunderers. Yeah. And then GW went and changed the War Scroll. Yeah. So that you could only include one of that type so that the War Scroll matched what came in the box. Yeah. They didn't they didn't change the Arcanaut company. But I think what you're talking about is when GW released their we're going to now officially support events thing mm -hmm. is that in order to be a fully supported event, there were certain rules that your event had to follow. And one of them was it had to be Games Workshop models and that they had to play by what you see is what you get, um, which is what it should be. You know, yeah. Unless, yeah, if, it's a, if it's a converted model, like your Witch Elves, the... Um, uh, the chicks, the spider chicks that you yeah. use for your, for, the hag for your snake lady, for the hag queen, yeah. those are awesome. Thanks, but man. there's not another model that it could be confused as, you know. Right. So that's what they're trying to avoid, and um, <laughs> so it's important if you're playing a competitive yeah. event and you're you're halfway through and you can't remember, did he say that was this or that? Because you can't tell from looking at it. Right, you make a right. decision based on wrong information, it costs you the game. That's not fun. That's not fun for no. anybody. No, it's not. And um, so that's you know that's why I haven't really got into the care drone because I love the aesthetic of them, but it's just and of course the the recent addition is really nerfed shooting armies. Yeah. And um, you know they're n it's not that they aren't viable; it's just they're not as effective as they were. Yeah. Because once you get them in combat, they're only shooting. You know, put them in combat with something hard, and they're not going anywhere. Right. You, I mean, that's kind of like old fantasy with the shooting. You know, you couldn't shoot out of combat in the old fantasy, and it kind of oh. makes sense. Mm -hmm. but, no, it yeah, totally it makes sense. It does. I yeah, love the new shooting. Yeah, because shooting was very, very powerful, and uh. In first general's handbook and very powerful in the second general's handbook, because my my winning list for the first crucible, which was general's handbook one, um, was four units of hunters and a hurricanum <laughs> in a gnarl root list. Yeah, I was basically playing Tau in Age of Sigmar. <laughs> and it was just <laughs> then that hurricanum. Tell me what the hurricanum does again, because everybody was playing it. So the hurricanum it gives a bubble of plus one to hit. So to all order units. So it's not specifically free peoples. It's anything that is order gets plus one to hit. Gotcha. So that's that's the big deal there. Mm -hmm. But it is also a mage because you take the hero version because it's the same points as the. Be the behemoth version which is stupid yeah. but <laughs> then you have your comet of cassandora spell which can do 3d6 mortal wounds if you get lucky on the roll and it's a shooting attack so you couldn't you couldn't dispel it and or the what I, maybe that no the comet of cassandora was the it could do one d3 or d6 mortal wounds to a unit then it had a shooting attack that if you rolled really well it just did a metric ton of mortal wounds itself granted it was only at 18 inches but still yeah couple that with um i had so four units 12 they all got that was 24 shots a turn rend one hitting on threes the champs hitting on twos wounding on threes rend one doing d3 damage Ugh. i would just point my army at a unit and delete it yeah and it's just, it was didn't matter and uh like my buddy played zinch when it first came out and it was just like all right so i just all the hunters keep your secrets dead 
or not keeper of secrets um the bird yeah <laughs> lord of change lord the change, lord yeah. of change dead gone he's like that's like my army i'm uh, like yeah that's why i killed it yeah <laughs> so which you know but that army got you know, just smashed a bits because one kirnoth hunters went from 180 points up to 220 but now they're down to 200 so i, I feel 200 is about where the melee one should be i feel the bow ones with the new shooting roll rules should be at 180 because they're not as effective as they were in first edition at 180 you know yeah. so par level wise i think they they would be good at 180 but the melee ones are definitely worth the 200 points and um and the hurricanum went from i think it was 320 went up to 380 so for everything just, you can do that sounds about right oh yeah it was it was way under costed but now it's it's too expensive mm -hmm. to take in other armies and uh, i think it still does well in like a free guild army um you know with your gun line and because it buffs all them and they're all shooting anyway but yeah, it's just everything gets nerfed and buffed and so quickly in this game anymore. It's like, well, they could drop that thing another 20 points and it could be right at its sweet spot next general sandbook and it could get played a bunch. You know, we never know. Yeah. And, um, so many people out there too good at finding those, those hidden oh, gems, yeah. those things we forgot about. Oh, definitely, definitely. Especially, I don't feel there's a whole lot anymore with older models mm -hmm. because or older armies that don't have battle tomes anymore um i have the the frost heart phoenix is still ridiculous mm -hmm. it is just so tanky and puts out so much damage you know the order army running two of those with a couple mages and it's just those are awesome i love that army but now that they've unofficially taken away all of the retired units or whatnot because they never updated the points for all of the compendium armies even though they said on their facebook page well yeah you can still use them just use the old points well events aren't going for that and they're yeah. dis disallowing compendium stuff so it's yeah it's, it's too bad they're, they're yeah. phased out Mm -hmm. Well, and some of the stuff is like still recent sculpts and still recent. Yeah. yeah, it's like, I don't know why they're doing away with all of these war machines. Like, war machines are cool. Yeah, the uh, Reaper Bolt Thrower for yeah. the Dark Elves. Well, that one was, because that one was a metal one and it went to yeah. fine cast. Um, but they redid the High Elf one. It was a plastic kit. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, why did you? do that away that was still a good model and uh you know i just expected that it would uh, eventually come out in a book or whatnot but then we got the the stormcast bolt thrower which is kind of a high elf-esque style bolt thrower yeah just with stormcast so you know maybe the the war machines aren't going the way of the dodo bird but then again, I'd like to see some stuff from brought back yeah. uh, from our armies, whether it's an updated kits or just um, the the plastic kits that were still good. I don't want to see any more fine cast stuff. I no. cannot stand fine cast. I, I tried to do a few models that are fine cast, and yeah, it was it was a challenge. Oh yeah, it's when it thing. first came out, and they're toting it as the next best thing, and oh look at the detail on this stuff. I was like, oh wow, this is really detailed. But then it's like your swords are breaking, stuff is warped, and it's you have all the issues with resin, but without the durability of the Forge World resin. Yeah. So it's like. Eh. But then, like, on big pieces, like, I was talking to Tim about this, because his Mangler squigs are fine cast, but they're big, solid chunks of fine cast. Yeah. And he said, it's great, because if these are metal, they wouldn't be able to stand up like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine seeing one so, of those things, like a big metal softball on the table. 
Right, exactly. But it's just, you know, when it's the big chunky stuff like that, it's fine. But when it's the little fiddly stuff and the details, they just break. Everything breaks. And it's like, I've had... I bought an, um, the original Illyrial. Um, not the original metal one, but the one they did just in fine cast for when they really re-released the High Elves back in 8th edition. And I literally had to send that model back three times because of the sculpt being, um, like, offset. So her face was, like, split in half and, like, <laughs> awkwardly placed. And so was her body. And I'm like, well, this is dumb. And, awesome. um, I love the attention to that now, though, that... Oh, yeah. It's rare to get a model, at least in my experience, it's rare to get a model that the important part has those splits and divides. Now it seems like it's mostly hidden in cloaks, places easy to fill the gaps. Oh, right, yeah. It's, uh, it's very, uh, the GW's modeling is on point, and how they do their sprues and stuff is just amazing. Yeah. But if you ever have an issue with a model, I have never met a company that takes so good care of you and doesn't even, like, give you a hard time. Yeah, they'll ask for the receipt, or yeah, they'll ask to send a picture of the, um, whatever the broken piece is, or whatever the missing piece is. But it's like, I bought a box of witch elves, and I've had this happen with sprues before, where the mold didn't fully fill and so it was like I was missing half of a body on one of the witch elves and I just went to Games Workshop said hey this is the sprue oh no problem here gave me a brand new box that's I'm like that's awesome and it was like I had the little um, droplet soul seed pods that go underneath the beetle on a larial mm-hmm. um the sprue that they were on, all of them had air bubbles in them. So they didn't, they just, as soon as they came out the sprue, they just shattered. Mm. And I'm like, well, this sucks. And I called up GW. They're like, okay, well, just send us a picture of it, and we'll send you out new ones. And uh, they sent me out, like, a just a full sprue with those pieces on it. And I was like, cool. And, um... The other thing that happened, I bought the terrain set from last Christmas that was like all of the Age of Sigmar buildings, basically. And the Dragon Fate Dias, Diocese, or whatever that one is. The flames that go on there, apparently there was a problem with the mold kit that the flames weren't getting injected with plastic either. And so I'm looking at this, I'm like, I'm supposed to have eight flames, I only have six. (laughs) So I called them up and they're like, oh yeah, we know about that. We'll send you out new ones. And they sent me out like a clipped up sprue, but just all the, the eight flames. And I'm like, oh, cool. So yeah, it's just, you know, anytime, and I've seen lots of stories about this. You know, I've seen one kid talking about getting a drop pod that the doors were warped. Mm-hmm. And this was a model he had bought off eBay, and didn't matter. They just sent her. Sent they just one. sent him a sent him a brand new drop pod. I'm That's like, great. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's the models may be expensive, but it's a company that takes care of you, and especially with what they're doing now, um, I'm I'm really happy the way games workshop has gone i was i was a little worried when age of sigmar first came out and the years before that where they just you know we're games workshop we're king of the hill we'll do what we want we're gonna tell you what you want yeah that was not the way to run the business kings of war wouldn't even really be a thing right now if they they hadn't handled things the way they did during that transition Oh, 100% would not be a thing at all. Something, speaking of that, something I would love to see Games Workshop do in the future, because they're moving all of the Warhammer Fantasy armies to Legacy. Um, I totally did air quotes, like you can see. <laughs> I can hear, I can, I can hear right. the fingers in the air. Right, right. <laughs> um, something I would love to see them do is how they did, oh, was it Battle for Five Armies? Whatever the Lord of the Rings yeah. thing is, where they had the movement trays for the round bases, 
I would love to see them like convert the Age of Sigmar rules to the Warhammer Fantasy world to use those legacy armies and make the because the one part I miss about fantasy was a little bit of the complexity. I know that that was a barrier of entry and the amount of models you needed yeah. was a barrier of entry. But as a side game, I would love to have that rank and flank, you know, denying the flanks. Your movement was amazing. Yeah. I love getting my reavers around the corners of enemies to where I can shoot you, but you can't see me. You know, that was an aspect of fantasy that I love doing yeah. was the movement and the positioning of your units and all that stuff. It still feels uh, weird to me, but just moving skirmish pieces, I always feel like in 8th edition, a millimeter meant something. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? A millimeter was a big difference, like you're saying. Like, you could, we, we, we get the laser pointers out all the time. So <laughs> oh, can I, can yeah. I see that guy? Can I shoot him? Uh-huh. And now there's so much, I don't know, it's, it's so much more organic, I guess. I don't know how to express it, but the, those little variances are lost. You know, there's no way to go back and double check that, oh, you know, maybe you did move this, you know, three millimeters too far, and now it's in combat and it shouldn't have been. And no, no, no. I, I completely understand, you know, having those front arcs and just positioning was key. And something that I missed from 6th edition was guest ranges. I know that that is another major barrier to entry, but <laughs> man, that was, that is the definition of being a decent player and an amazing player because it's like you could just be having a fun game and i i remember this this is when i was playing at the games workshop store i'm playing my dwarfs and i have stone throwers and stuff and uh you know i'm always a happy-go-lucky guy i'm there to have a good time and you know but i don't like when shenanigans are happening like if you're if you're questioning everything and you're stretching your movements and you're doing like i like tight play and fair play yeah and we're gonna have a good time but if my opponent is is not doing that and they're being a jerk it's that leads to not a fun game but no. i was having that type of experience and this guy's like well this and this and this and i'm like listen here's the rules please read your rules <laughs> and um, he's like, you know, he's boasting and why, you know, I know this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, all right, I guess it's serious time. And I'm like, okay, this bolt thrower, 38 and a half inches, dead center here. How do you know that? Bam, right in the middle, roll a direct hit, destroyed. This stone <laughs> thrower, you know, and just tore his army up. He's like, oh, man. And it's just <laughs> one of those moments, you know, you can go from having just a fun game and that, and then you turn it on for real. And um, just to, you know, show your skill. Of course, then Games Workshop came out with their their uh, Realm of Battle with 24-inch grid on it. So measuring now would not be the... Uh, would not be the same as it was when mm-hmm. you were playing on a 4x6 plywood. But um, that, that's another aspect I miss. You yeah. know, it's not necessarily a positive one to someone who does not have that skill or the ability to acquire that skill. Mm-hmm. You know, I understand. Pre-measuring makes the game go a lot faster and smoother, and I'm totally happy with it now. It's just, you know, nostalgia. <laughs> everything is... Well, you're also is better. you're a very tall guy. You might you get to look straight down at the table. <laughs> right, <laughs> it makes yeah. measuring a little easier. Uh huh. No, to- <laughs> totally. Uh, so you have uh, got the league coming up uh, mm-hmm. this month. Tell us about the league. So starting January fifth, this Saturday, um, we're going to be doing a five week league. Um, right after the 40k league because games workshop decided to do a campaign this month so planning ahead was difficult yeah. <laughs> and um, we'll be having it at the Kissimmee Coliseum of comics um, we'll be holding it from six in the evening till nine o'clock at night um, starting this year we're actually introducing a new 
um, system. It's going to be the Wall of Champions at Coliseum. It's going to be all games that are played in Coliseum. You'll move up ranks um, in Infinity, basically. So instead of pursuing a win-loss-draw style of leagues, we're going to be doing an achievement style of leagues um, where it doesn't matter how many games you play or whether you win those games, lose those games, draw those games. It's going to be about what you do during those games. So say we have the Reign of Fire happen during one of your games and your entire army survives the Reign of Fire. Um, you would get an achievement for that. And say you killed your opponent's general with your general, you would get an achievement for that. Doesn't matter if your opponent wiped your entire army off the board, you would still get that achievement and move up on the leaderboard. And um, it's definitely wanting to encourage more of a fun environment over a competitive environment. Yeah. Um, what I've found in the past is Path to Glory is good for like a one-day event, but when it goes for weeks, some players' armies get way out of hand. Yeah. And it becomes, you know, one player has a thousand points of models versus a player's three thousand points of models. So what I'm doing for this league is players are going to... Um, be set to 1,250 points. Um, they're going to need one hero and two battle line, um, like the 1,000 points. Um, you're not going to be allowed to take any special characters, and you're not taking any extra command traits or artifacts of any sort. And no War Scroll Battalions, right? No War Scroll Battalions either. Um, we do have, it's on the uh, Facebook page, Coliseum of Comics Miniature Gaming. Um, it is uh, open to the public, and you can request to join. Anyone can join it. And you manage that site, right? I do. And um, so with that, we will be using the Path to Glory points not to add to your army, but to make units veteran units or to buy artifacts or to get command traits or to get extra spells stuff like that something i've not liked about path to glory in the past is or even like the skirmish or whatnot is you don't get to use your allegiance abilities yeah. and i feel a lot of armies core to that army is your allegiance abilities if you're playing you know sylvaneth and you can't set up woods, and I know how some people feel about those woods, but <laughs> those woods play a key part to the Sylvaneth army. You need those woods for your army to function how it's supposed to function. So I am letting every single army use their allegiance abilities. You just can't add the extra things. You're going to earn those over the course of the games. So, as you earn achievements, as you um, play the scenarios that I will be providing day of, and, you know, earning those scenario points and such, that will be how you get stuff for your characters, how you upgrade your units, how you do that. So, it's kind of a matched play narrative just to keep the shenanigans reined in but also keep that open play feel about it you know because you don't have to um meet all the requirements to everything and you're not trying to min max stuff and it's it's i think it's going to be really cool and i'm definitely going to go with um what i liked from past leagues is the surprise events <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh it's it's 10 minutes into the games this is what happens <laughs> i'm excited about it i'm really excited i'm gonna do my best uh, if people can't make all of them so it's not going to be based on attendance and it's not a ladder system as i as, as i have used in the past where you're where you're hurt if you don't make it to every single one of them, um, there will be 
an achievement stamp that you earn for attending that week. It's one achievement out of the, I think we're going to have 30 achievements that can be unlocked throughout the league. But with such small numbers, if you want to come early, get games in for it. Um, I show up there after work about 3.30, 4 o'clock. And um, even, I mean, you can play against me. And um, I'll be there as well. And get those awesome. achievements. And it's just, it's going to be more of a, you have five weeks to complete this list. And only five of them are going to be based on attendance. And um, so it's not necessarily, it won't be that detrimental. That's so, great. and the way it contributes to the leaderboards, all events contribute to the leaderboards. So if you play in the 40K event and play in the Age of Sigmar event, both of your achievements and both of those will go towards the leaderboard for the store there so that people can be like, I need to beat that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so That's cool. You ever watch yep. Adventure Brothers? Yes, I have. This reminds me of the Guild of Calamitous Intent. <laughs> that, like just rogues gallery of uh, Coliseum regulars up there on the wall. All right. I'm really looking forward to this. So thanks a lot for putting this together. All right. Well, that sounds very good. I appreciate it. With the name Coliseum of Comics, I've seen a lot of people abbreviate that COC. For Kissimmee, do you abbreviate it COCK? Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get some shirts made. Nope. No, we, uh, we, <laughs> when we talk about the store, it's just the um, Coliseum Kissimmee. So, gotcha. Not the COCK. Yeah, yeah. Nope. Definitely yeah. not that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, yeah, because you organize the COCK. You, you're in control of all the COCK events. Right, exactly. I can be a big old COCK sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua, thank you very much for doing this with me. Uh, it means a lot, and I'll, I'll let you know as soon as we get this out there. Hey, not a problem. I appreciate the interview, and uh, I look forward to seeing everyone who comes out. Awesome. Thanks again. Good night, everybody. Good night. This has been an episode of Orlando. I am Adam. You can get a hold of me on Twitter, at Orlando77, or on Instagram, at Orlando. And you can reach Mark on Instagram and Twitter with the handle at Orlando Mark. And you can reach Nicholas on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Nicolunch. Please leave comments. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And thank you very much for listening.